Good morning, everybody. I welcome all of you to this session on Shri Girish Karat's new play, Rakshasa Tangadi. There's an English version of this play, Crossing to Thali Kote, which will be soon released by Oxford University Press. Hopefully. <laughs> um, I'm deeply honored to be in conversation with one of India's greatest modern playwrights, Girish Karnad. <clears throat> Rakshasa Tangadi joins his line of historicals, Tughlaq, Paledanda, Tipu Sultan, Rings of Tipu Sultan. Karnad, through his historicals, repossesses lost versions of history and culture. Mm. Karna, through his plays, gives you an example of how historical fiction as a genre can bring back to you historical knowledge, one that defies dominant ideological narratives. Karnad, for material of his plays, uses myth, folklore, and history. What does he do with them? To answer simply, he creates theater. He prepares a site on which discourses of historical thinking and literature is constructed. The literary merit of his plays lies in his ability to invent speech for his characters, rich and polyphonic in their utterances. Their archetypes, yet individuals, realized in deep psychological realms. The lines of some of Karnad's plays are so lyrical that for a reader, it just gets hammered into his head and heart. And each time you go back to the text, they come back richer in meaning. For instance, in Yayati, Belakilada Dari Ali Nadia Bahudu Puru Adre Kanasugalila Dari Kanasugalila Dari Ali Hoga Bahude Tuglak Nana Raja Dali Prati on the Kariavo Prathani Akabeku. Prati on the Prathaniu Aridina Metalagabeku. Prati on the Metilo Devara Sanihake Voyabeku. The way Karnad embeds the poetic in his historical discourse is indeed remarkable. Rakshasa Tangadi is the last in his line of place in the sense that. Taledanda, Tipu Sultan, and now Rakshasa Tangadi capture three major episodes in the thousand-year history of Karnataka. It's fascinating to know why he picks up these three episodes from history, and also why he calls the play Rakshasa Tangadi in Kannada and Crossing to Thali Kote in English. Thank you. <clears throat> the point is. If you look at the last thousand years of Karnataka history, three episodes stand out as moments of conflict, but also where revaluation of our entire way of life took place. One was in the 11th century, the Vachana uh, 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 revolution led by Baswana, um, you know, uh, and the clashes and the Kannada philosophy that came up. That also ended in disaster, I'm afraid. Then on the 18th century, uh, 1799, in fact, Tipu Sultan, that last of our great uh, freedom fighters, and you know who didn't even allow an English resident to in his court, that conflict, and right in the middle, between the 11th century and the 18th century, is this uh, 1565, the Battle of Rakshasthangadi, um, you know, which destroyed 
the entire Vijayanagara Empire. In one day, the biggest empire of that period was destroyed. So now, uh, let me explain why I call it Rakshas Tangiri. Where the battle took place um, is not sure. Now let me to, uh, make it clear by just drawing, explaining to you the map. I will do it with my hand. I didn't bring an actual map because nothing would be seen here. <laughs> so, you see, if you look at the map of uh, South India, it's like that. You know, it's, it's a triangle. And right across this South India runs the river of Krishna. It starts on the western edge and goes right up to the right. In 1565, and before that, north of this river was occupied by sultanates. They were the Bahamani kings who had split. And now there are five kingdoms, uh, you know, Bijapur, Ahmednagar, um, Golconda, uh, Bidar, and, and uh, another one which didn't come into the battle. So those five are up there. If you look at the map, you look, they look like five sacks, you know, cement sacks, which have been piled on top of a shelf, one on top of another. South of the, uh, Krishna was the entire Vijayanagar Empire. And in 1565, the two clashed. And the whole Vijayanagar Empire was destroyed on the 24th of January, within a span of a day. Half you know, day. half a day. And this has been a um, source of great contention as to what happened. Now, the mythology, now, now let me stop uh, start off by explaining the title. Where the battle took place is a bit of a mystery. It's been going on, and oh, two places are mentioned. One is a place called Talikote, which is the name referred to in the English title, uh, crossing to Talikote. Or other place is called a uh, uh, couple of villages, Rakshastangari, Rakshastangari, and so on. Now, in one of the contemporary texts, contemporary document, documents, it's mentioned as Rakshas Tangari. You know, the Rakshas Tangari. And I thought, what a fabulous name for a play. Here is Rakshas, this Sanskrit word, and Tangari, an Urdu word. You must have heard Tangari to Urdu. You know, I'll break your leg. Uh, and this kind of combination of Rakshas and Tangari, uh, there, sitting there, calling out to be used. So I use that. So the play is called Rakshas Tangari, the name of the place where the... Um, so in Canada, I use Rakshas Tangari, and in um, uh, Sanskrit, in English, uh, crossing to Talikot. So that's the explanation. And what more? Why did you say crossing to Talikot in English? Yeah, because Rakshas Tangari is unpronounceable in English. <laughs> you know, you have to have a name that people will pronounce. Uh, and, you know, talk to. Uh, can you imagine when the play is produced, whenever it's produced? Now, 10 years later, 50 years. People say, you know, I saw that fabulous production in, what, what was it? What's it? Rak <laughs> Raksha. You know, I've, I've been through it all in my theater history. So I thought I would give it a very simple name, uh, Tali Kota, which is an accepted name. Historians accept that the battle may also have taken uh, place there. Now, Having, do you want to continue to you ask? Can, yeah, yes, <clears throat> if you want to say something, you can. Well, continue. You ask. Then I'll come, come in. Uh, historic, uh, historical is uh, never just about history. Uh, history is used as a means to speak about uh, the present. Uh, perhaps as Brecht says, historicization constitutes a fundamental interpretive attitude. Therefore, we are constantly, through a historical plot, reading meanings into the present. But history is also histories. It's multiple histories. So in the case of the Vijayanagar history, we have Robert Sewell's history, Richard Eaton's history, Suryanath Kamath's history. So how do we define our history and to which present, we, we live in multiple presents, to which present are we mapping it onto? Well, one's perception of history itself 
Now, let me take this example. One's perception of history changes. You know, we know about this battle because an English uh, officer called Robert Sewell, or Sewell, I don't know how it's pronounced, wrote a book called A Forgotten Empire. And he wrote it in 1900, 100 years ago. And he wrote about it and he said that what this battle was, it was a battle between Hindus and Muslims. And you know, the Muslims came in and destroyed Hindus. That's the perception. And the perception has lasted and the perception has proved very convenient to many ideological, uh, you know, someone like Neil Kant Shastri, you know, also happily quotes, uh, you will talk about it, I won't, I won't go into it because he's, he's the expert in color. The point is, these are the kind of mythologies that are handed down. Yeah. And I was interested, but I was interested, I'll talk of personal reasons. I have been fascinated by, have you, have, have you seen Humpy? I hope so, yeah. So you'll know what it's like. It's the most spectacular ruin in India. And it's remained um, spectacular because it's remained a ruin. Nothing has been uh, allowed to be built up. And from 1665 to now, uh, it's, it's been there. Yeah. You see, and when I looked at it, one thing always used to bother me. If it is true that the Muslims and the Sultanates who were north of uh, the Krishna River invaded Vijayanagar, how is it that the battle happened north of the river? You know, it should be the other way around. I mean, uh, um, you know, their army should be somewhere in the south. But you look from a map, the uh, Rakkastangari or uh, Tarikota are north of the river. Now, this has never been explained, and historians have just ignored it. It bothers you. And this is where playwrights get bothered, you know, because you've got to understand what, uh, what this is about and what happened. And the second thing, when you uh, look at the story, the fascinating, why it's so fascinating, is that the Vijayanagara army was led by Ram Raya who was the ruler of Vijayanagar, but he was not the king. You know, he was the son-in-law of the king, earlier Ramaraya, but he was not allowed to be the king. And there was a puppet king. So here was this very powerful Ramaraya defending a kingdom which he was not allowed to rule. You know, and, and when you look at it, you, all kinds of intricacies emerge of what happened. And that ultimately is what fascinates one about history. You know, you look at history, and history blandly says Hindus fought Muslims, or this was the perception, and so on. But when you look, even today, if you go to Hampi, they will tell you, this is how the Muslims destroyed uh, the Hindu empire. And you look at why did it happen? Such a powerful kingdom, the whole of South India, disappeared in, as you said, half a day, collapsed. And so that had been fascinating me, and that's why I decided it, it was worth, um, you know, historical plays are not written, because, well, there are people who write history plays to glorify history. Um, yes, well, if it gives them pleasure, I wish them well. But the point is that history is fascinating because it challenges you. Why do certain things happen? You know, why did they happen? We'll come to that later, please. Masti's Thali Kote is way too different. He, he constructs a very different picture of this whole episode in history that you're talking of. Why do you think Masti read, read it the way? Why do you think Masti read it the way he did? Masti Venkatesh Iyengar. Masti Venkatesh Iyengar reads the same episode in a very different way. Masti Venkatesh Iyengar. God bless his soul, he's one of the great Kannada writers. And he wrote a play on that called Tali Kote. Tali Kote. Yeah. Um, why did he write the play? As one playwright to another, let me desist. <laughs> he was not a playwright. He was not a historian. Can you imagine? I mean, there are people who write history plays without reading history. Now, I'm going to quote another good playwright as an example of people how good. I wrote a play called Taladanda. That was my first play about Basavanda and Bijara. 
the Bijula king and so on, uh, who was a Lingayat, and Lankesh, one of our, our great playwrights, very important playwright, wrote a play called Sankranti, which is about Bijula. And after he saw my play, he came to me and said, do you know, I didn't know Bijula was a Lingayat. I thought he was a Jain. So, you know, a man writes a play about one of the most important episodes, doesn't even bother to check the facts. Because history plays are not supposed to be related into uh, facts. But the interesting thing about history plays is what they reveal. You know, I mean, um, in this play, I, I can give away the climax, you know what the climax is. The climax is that the four Muslim sultanates got together and beat ultimately Vijayanagar. And someone said to me, this is like Mahagathabandhan. <laughs> it was not intended, but that's what historical plays do. They suddenly become relevant in terms of, um, well, history changes, but I think historical figures tell you what your contemporaries are doing exactly. It's like reading a newspaper, actually. So, Richard Eaton makes it very clear that it was not Mahagatabandhan, yeah. <laughs> isn't it? He says that there was, it was the relationship between the North and South was not Hindu versus Muslim no. or North versus South or Persian versus uh, yeah. Telugu Kannada. It was very free flowing yeah. and the Hindu kingdom wanted to preserve the Hindu territory and it was never anti-Muslim and it was similar for them, I guess. The point is that religion didn't matter. Yeah. If you are born a Hindu, you are born a Hindu. Yeah. If you are born a Muslim, you are born a... This whole idea that... You know, you know, do you know, someone as intelligent as Naipaul criticizes R.K. Narayan because he says, R.K. Narayan was in Mysore and he is not horrified by the fact... Or by Humpy, Pumpy, uh, uh, Humpy. He saw a whole city destroyed, a Hindu city destroyed by Muslims. But you see no evidence in R.K. Narayan that it touches him. You know, ultimately when you look back, Arkan Narayan was more intelligent than Naipaul. That's all it pulled. Because Narayan had a sense of how human beings work, which Naipaul, great writer, <laughs> but, but with his ideology, completely seems to have lost. Because if obviously, this again is the same thing. Obviously, only thing Naipaul read on this subject was a forgotten, uh, a forgotten Empire, 1900, and that was imp enough. On that he built the whole history. But what is marvelous, Deepa, and you will also talk about it, is how these uh, Muslim historians kept detailed records of what happened. Shirazi, I think. Hmm? Shirazi. Many. Uh -huh. There were three of them, Alwa. Hmm. Three, four. Hmm. You know, yeah. and uh, Just, there are histories. Shiraz. And they have been available, except that they have been in Persian. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and when you read them, you have day-to-day -day accounts of what happened. You know? Um, and um, later on, we will call on... Uh, uh, yeah. um, in a bit. The, in a bit, you know, uh, this. And you will see that that scene is straight from, straight from the uh, uh, documents as written by historians. Yeah. You know? Shiraz. She, you know, she and so on. So it's just amazing. And let me say this thing that I was, as I said, bothered for many years by this fact that the battle was in the wrong side of the river. Mm -hmm. And why it should be. When I went to Hampi also and I looked at the map, I said, why is it happening in the wrong side of the river? Why are the, why are the you know, etc., etc., etc. And then um, an American historian called Robert Eaton concentrated on Ram Raya Richard and Eaton. Richard Eaton, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, concentrated on Ram Raya. He has written, he has written a book called uh, Six uh, South Indian Now. Yeah. This brilliant book in which he, uh, he has taken Ram Raya and he shows how Ram Raya mattered. How this is not Hindu versus Muslim, but how one um, person, you know, one uh, he was like a Napoleon, actually, in Ram Raya, um, you know, and how he transformed the whole history. Yeah. Uh, the British passed off legendary history as history. Uh, a good historian 
is constantly trying to striving to separate these blurring lines between history and myth. A good writer is constantly striving to preserve or protect his ambivalences, given the current climate of binaries that we occupy. I find your work, as someone who's worked like a good historian and a good writer, this is an extraordinary act of courage. What were your apprehensions and doubts when you set out on this? You see, one thing about the advantage or disadvantage of writing a play is that you have to deal with characters. You cannot just broadly write, you know, Rama married Sita, Sita, and Ravana carried Sita away, etc. Each character has to be delineated. The, uh, you know, uh, the playwright deals with each character, which means then you have to go into the psychology of that characters. Why did they... And that is very often what the historians are not interested in. Historians will tell you this is what happened. Or at least the earlier historians, I mean, I'm not talking, you know. And more and more, um, it's, it's like... A super example is what we're talking about. Uh, in Yakshagana, there is a form called Tala Maddala in Karnataka, where what happens is the actors sit and they play Rama, Ravana, or uh, Duryodhana and Bhima and so on. They don't put on any dress. They just improvise. And each one plays that character and justifies why I did it. So that if there's a good uh, Tala Maddala performance, Duryodhana comes as the hero and Bhima comes out as the villain. And the audience claps and applauds and then goes on as though Duryodhana is the villain. So, you see, this ability for characters to emerge from the background of myth and this, that is um, what makes historical writing, historical plays interesting. Uh, Vasundara Filiozet. Uh, she says something very interesting. She's someone who's uh, an Indologist and epigraphist of repute. Uh, she has studied over 150 inscriptions, most of which are in Kannada in the Hampi, Patakkal, uh, Badami region. She says there's nothing called the Vijayanagara Empire. It was always called the Karnataka, Karnataka. Em Empire. She always also says something else. She says that there was no goddess Bhuvaneshwari. It, it was a legend that was concocted in 18th century and later, you know, transplanted onto the Vijayanagar period. Um, in your play, interestingly, in Act 10, when Ramaraya goes to seek permission from his mother for the big battle, he says, I'm going in defense of the Karnataka Empire. That's the only occurrence in your play when you talk of Vijayanagar Empire as the Karnataka Empire. And in the very same scene, a few lines later, you, uh, there are slogans, Jai Bhuvaneshwari. I, I, so I'll, let me tell you that this is how what historians do. Robert Searle, who wrote the book, Forgotten Empire, knew that it was not called a Vijayanagar Empire. He knew it was called Karnataka Empire. You know, but what he did is, if I say Karnataka, then the Andhra historians won't be interested in what I've written. It literally, he admits to it. So he called it Vijayanagar Empire, made it, you know, grand, so that the Telugu Empire uh, uh, historians can also claim credit for it. And this has been followed even by Kannada people. You know, uh, Saletor and so on. Alur Venkatra also perhaps knew that it was... Uh, yeah, they all, they all yeah. do. Yeah. So that's the, that's the point. Can you mm. ask uh, yeah. Arud and yeah. I can present? Yeah. yeah. Um, can I invite uh, Arundhati Nag on stage? Let me mention that these five sultanates continually fought between themselves. You know, on the north of the river. They had no hope of going to the south of the river. They continued to squabble. But because they were so small, they couldn't come to any decision. So they took help from Vijayanagar. So dear Ram Raya helped one sultan one day, another sultan another day, and played them against each other because he had nothing else to do. He was the ruler of the whole of South India. And he couldn't rule his own uh, kingdom because he was not the king. You know? So now, ultimately, he uh, was called by Ali Adil Shah of Bijapur to help him. He helped Ali Adil Shah, defeated um, um, Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar, 
because uh, they wanted a fort, particular fort. And this is what happened after the battle. Um, Aru will read scene six, which is the most uh, crucial scene in the play. It's a turning point. And this scene carries the forebodings of the huge tragedy that's going to come. Venkatadri, please read out to the Sultan the details of the conflicts we have had between us. Nizam Shah. Nandanayaka Venkatadri does not need to trouble himself. Every one of those battles is vividly present in our memory. There's a pause. The Nizam continues. The master of Vijayanagara knows that we did not want this conflict. The Sultan of Ahmednagar has no complaints against the ruler of Vijayanagara. This was merely a matter of minor adjustment between Ahmednagar and Bijapur. We failed to understand how Vijayanagara got drawn into it. Ramaraya. Sultan Adil Shah has extended to us his hand of friendship, indeed of kinship. Nizam Shah, the whole Deccan rejoices at this development. It will indeed be our good fortune if the Suratrana displays the same benevolence to the other sultans as well. Ramaraya suddenly decides to bring this mock formality to a close. You are in possession of the fort of Kalyana. We would like it to be handed over to the Sultan Adil Shah. That's all. Nizam Shah, the fort was in fact in the possession of Bijapur 10 years ago and it was handed over to us by no one else but you. We can say with pride that we have showered all our attention on its safety and security. We fail to understand how... Ramaraya, we are not in the habit of explaining our decisions to anyone. Nizam Shah, we are neighbours. If there's been a lapse on our part, Ramaraya, you have had it for 10 years. You have had Kalyana for 10 years. Enough. Now let Bijapur have his turn. Nizam Shah, we are helpless if the... Ramaraya suddenly cuts him by moaning and lurching as though he's losing his balance. He grabs his forehead. An attendant, ra attendant rushes in, starts massaging his forehead. Venkatadri two steps forward, but Ramaraya shoes him away. He snarls at the attendant. Here, here, you fool! A little further back, idiot! Yes, that's better. Suddenly, friendly, still holding his forehead, Ramaraya to the Nizam Shah. Surely, I don't need to explain such an elementary point. These are four of you sultans on my northern border and I need to keep you under firm control. Vigilance is of the essence, is that clear? Enough. Venkatadri, have you informed the honorable sultan of our terms? Venkatadri, yes brother, we have. Ramaraya, and they are acceptable to him. Nizam Shah, please Suratrana, I, I only... Ramaraya with a show of exasperation. Nothing's ever simple. Vijayanagara is famed for its beetle leaves. They have no match in the world for the red color they bring to the lips. The Sultan should order some for his zanana. Without waiting for Nizam to start chewing his pan, Ramaraya touches his forehead in mock farewell and leaves. But Venkatadri and the others watch as Nizam Shah steps towards Ahmadnagar, stands with his back to the city, and viciously spits out his mouthful of pan onto the ground. Professor C. N. Ramchandran will respond to the play. Respected Karnat and the members sitting in the auditorium. It's a privilege to speak on a play by Cornard on this August occasion. And I thank all the organizers for giving me this wonderful opportunity. As there isn't much time, I shall speak only on two points related to the play. The first one, the brilliant plotting of the play. And the second, the kind of history that such a plotting leads to. Now, coming to the first part, 
plotting it is a bipartite plot of two acts based broadly on the concept of cause and effect the first act as it were shows us the cause or causes of what happens in the second act it can be loosely called the decline in the first act and the fall of vijayanagara empire now let's consider the details of this cause and effect pattern in the play the major cause of the fall of vijayanagara is ramaraya's rule and the qualities that he brings forth as a ruler to start with he is a man of endless intrigues as karnad pointed out he would always play one sultan against the other almost heartlessly and secondly his dictatorship he wouldn't listen to his brothers also and he wouldn't allow the legitimate ruler the legitimate emperor sadashiva raya to be the ruler he was always kept under house arrest and ramaraya is a man with a grievance a grievance which he carries through everywhere he thinks that he belongs to a very great dynasty the chalukya dynasty but unfortunately he has to serve under a tuluva ruler tuluva means the man or the woman who comes from tulu nadu the coastal area of karnataka and this is for him a matter of total distress and therefore on many occasions he says here i am fighting for the tuluva with my sword and risking my life and here is that tuluva emperor sitting at home with his queens that he is a man with a constant grievance and of course his ruthlessness in fact so brilliantly she brought out today the kind of ruthlessness that ramaraya possessed and the way he humiliates the nizam of ahmednagar and all other sultans he has no respect for anybody but himself all these his matter of intrigues his dictatorship his grievances and his ruthlessness these together form the primary cause of the fall of the empire the second act shows us on the stage the result of such a cause that is some time or another they had to understand it they understand it at a particular point that is the four bahmani sultans understand that here is ramaraya playing one against the other and how long should they tolerate it therefore they come together and listening to the advice of the begum of ahmednagar they enter into marital relationships and thus form a grand alliance and they invade vijayanagara but they do not cross the krishna and finally owing to ramaraya's folly and his megalomania at 82 ramaraya decides to lead the entire vijayanagara army in this war in this battle and secondly when he has to enter the battlefield his generals advise him to sit on a horse whereas he says no he shouldn't be seen by everybody and therefore he sits on a palanquin and as soon as the muslim soldiers rush in the palanquin bearers they have their own life at stake therefore they run away and here is ramraya who is captured and later he is beheaded that is the fall of the vijayanagara empire primarily owing to ramraya but there are other causes also as the play shows that is the advanced military techniques of 
diversionary movements and camouflage followed by the sultans. And then, surprisingly, in such a vast, powerful empire, there was no second line of defense. And the city, the capital city, did not have any protection like a fort or a moat or any sort of uh, defense. It was completely helpless once the army fell. And also, I am amazed by the symmetry that the plotting uh, Cornard has thought of this one. I mean, it is just brilliant. For instance, the first act ends with Jahangir Khan's beheading. The second act ends with Ramaraya's beheading. The location of the first act is the palace. The location of the, settled, uh, set, uh, the second act is the background. Through such brilliant plotting, what the playwright wants to convey about history is that there is no history which is identifiable and which is monolithic and which is available to everyone. There is no history H capital. There are histories and they are constructs. And the constructs come into existence owing to the present day pressures, cultural and political pressures on the entire society. And therefore, we cannot accept any historian as the man or the woman telling the truth. Carnard um, talked of the most influential work on the Vijayanagara Empire, that is the one, the Forgotten Empire, written by Robert Sewell. Sewell was a scholar, but unknowingly, almost unconsciously, he had imbibed the colonial discourse, which saw the Muslims and the Hindus eternal enemies of each other, and which concluded, and which convinced the Indians that they were telling the truth, that they could not live together at all. And this was the divisive politics, first begun in 1900. I believe it was the time of Curzon, Lord Curzon, and that continued till the partition took place. And here, in this framework of colonial discourse, Sewell gave this model of Vijayanagara Empire being a Hindu bulwark against the heartless Islamic onslaught. And as Karnat said, this model was accepted by both the Muslim and the Hindu novelists, poets, writers, and historians because it served their own interests. Muslims welcomed the model because they could show themselves as the conquerors. And the Hindus liked it very much so that they could, uh, on the one hand, glorify the Hindu empire, that is Vijayanagara, and on the other hand, look at the Muslims as the other who invaded this country, who came here only to destroy their culture. And secondly, the play points out following the post-colonial view of history of the past. Okay, sure. How the colonial history of Vijayanagara or any other province need not be need not contain the whole truth. In fact, there can be another form of truth, and there could be other reasons. And they point out one important, interesting point, that is, Vijayanagara culture was not Hindu culture. Bijapur culture or Ahmednagar culture was not Islamic culture. Both followed the Persian culture and the Persian style of architecture and the Persian way of uh, raising the army and such. And secondly, the conquerors did not loot Vijayanagara as Sewell so emotively points out. In fact, much before the victorious army uh, reached Vijayanagara, 
it was looted by professional robbers and dacoits. And they did whatever else remained to be looted. That is all. That is, again, to make the point very clear, this play follows the post-colonial view of history, view of man, and argues, or it uh, persuades us to accept the fact that the history of any individual or any uh, empire or any country is only a construct. It is not absolute truth identifiable and available for anybody. And as long as there are different ideologies, so long there are different histories. Thank you very much. I think we've exceeded time and the discussion remains incomplete. Before we wind up, I'd like to mention two things. One is how um, it, it's very fascinating that Ramaraya is a Vainika and Adil Shahi is a Sufi poet and a lover of Sufi music and Kutub Shahi is a Telugu scholar. Karnat never makes his characters unidimensional. So, Ramaraya is not just the beast that he is. And the other thing that's very fascinating in the play is the agency that he gives to the Begums. In fact, the suggestions that they make change the course of history or has a huge implication on the way history takes its turns. I'm deeply enriched by reading this play and I hope the English edition will be out soon so that all of you can read it. Thank you. The only thing, sorry, if you want to go, how do you get started? Uh, no, I, I just want to say bye. The only thing, I'm, uh, the reason one goes to history is there's so much there that tells you about your own society. One doesn't, you know, writing this play, for instance, was a question, how the women were treated. You know, as she said, you know, the, the sultans had to be placated. So the Begum very casually says, let's marry our daughters to them. Finish. Two daughters married off, you know. And peace made. Similarly, on the Hindu side, Krishna Devaraya married his daughter to someone below his rank to provide a guardian for the king, Ramaraya, who could never become the king. And there is a seed of, you know, and so many complex issues that get lost or have got lost. It's been a pleasure to write the play, mainly because of that, because of, uh, you know, what it is. And I'm so grateful to the Bangalore Little Literature Festival and to you all for letting me here to talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you.